And the title I've chosen today revolves around both a question marks and uh, around uh, a word in, uh, in brackets. And it broaches two main questions. To what extent we can properly speak of and of the empires and why Italy today is still facing an unsuccessful decolonial process. And of course, I'm totally aware that providing overarching answers to such complex questions is far beyond the abilities of a single researcher. However, what I want to do today is to dig into the discrepancy between the end of a given political and historical experience to this the Italian presence in Africa and the enduring traces of that experience in modern and contemporary Italy. So my presentation will be roughly divided into three main sections. I will firstly deal with the historical and cultural contextualization of Italian expansionism and decolonization. And then the, the, the core, the heart of my talk will be a reflection on the cultural results of this peculiar decolonial process. And this will lead, lead us to the third and final section about the formation of post-colonial memories and on the modalities through which they still uh, crinkle and corrode our contemporary society. The fil rouge connecting this section will be the analysis of some meaningful visual products, which will help us to delve into the multifaceted ways in which colonial and post-colonial discourses have been spread in Italian society. Um, I would like to start with a, a, with a pretty uh, personal anecdote, just to share my positionality within this uh, topic. 11 years ago, in late springtime 2009, I was spending a weekend in my birthplace, uh, which is called Domus de Maria, which is the southernmost village of Sardinia. And I had agreed to sort through my late grandfather's cellar with very little enthusiasm, I must confess. But amid the books and newspapers that uh, he had collected over the decades, a set of notebooks suddenly captured my attention. Those notebooks dated back to 1936 when Italy invaded Ethiopia and when uh, my grandpa was attending the, uh, the fascist high schools. And an enthusiastic portrayal of the fascist empire emerged from the lines of his uh, handwriting. And similar ideas like uh, this one in, in this slide uh, returned in other compositions. And I was pretty surprised in the first instance because uh, grandpa was neither a black shirt, a fascist supporter, nor had he participated in any of the Italian colonial endeavors. And soon that surprise turned into an insatiable curiosity about how fascist colonial propaganda could have pervaded the everyday life of a village, which at the time was literally in the middle of the nowhere. Um, this short and very significant uh, personal chronicle does not aspire to be scientifically and methodologically exhaustive. I share it here with the aim to reflexively broach some of the themes we are going to deal with uh, uh, today. Mass media, colonial memories, and reconstruction, re representation of national belonging are the cardinal points triangulating my critical endeavor. And I'm going to adopt a critical historical perspective uh, in order to retrace the genealogies of the ambiguous threads composing the texture of Italian postcolonial scenario. So starting with uh, contextualization, uh, the geographical and historical entity we refer to as Italy has always been, a, I'm, I'm quoting, highly concentrated space of intercultural contact, to use uh, Charles Bardet words. This is because of its geographical position at the center of the Mediterranean, its physical proximity to Africa and to the Islamic world, its being connected to the Northwestern countries of Europe, as well as to the Balkans. And such geographical aspects have indelibly shaped the transnational character of national belonging. One can hardly understand modern and contemporary Italy without considering that between the late 19th century and the early 20th century, about 27 million of Italians migrated worldwide. Furthermore, since the, the 70s in the 20th century, of course, Italy has witnessed a significant influx of migrants. So the transnational character of Italian identity is created not only by the migratory flows of 
people over centuries, but also by the legacies of imperial projects that originated in the late 19th century. And for this, for this reason, I argue that the study of Italian expansion is, and of its end is one of indisputable relevance and importance. Soon after the achievement of the national unification, a process called Risorgimento, in the second half of the 19th century, Italy intended to compete with other European powers in the field of expansionism. At the time, we were at the zenith of the ages of empires, to use Eric Hobsbawm's words. Having some overseas colonies meant to being properly a Western nation, and uh, colonial expansions was to seen as a political and economic issues, as well as a, as a way to connect Italy, the new nation, the new unified nation, to the civilized and imperial countries of Northern Europe. So Italy interests lied in some Mediterranean regions like Tunisia and in the Red Sea, the Horn of Africa. And due to that, the, the deadlock in the Mediterranean Sea, in uh, 1890, Italy formalized its colonial presence in Eritrea, and in 1908, it did the same in Somalia. The two colonies were to provide a useful springboard for future incursions into the territory of their neighbor, Ethiopia, whose, con whose conquest was Italy's biggest target. However, the Italian ambition dealt a massive blow in, 19, in 1896 when the troops of the Emperor uh, Menelik crushed the Italian army. Uh, despite this thinking defeat, Italian colonial ambition did not completely freeze and a wave of nationalism swept Italy, leading to the formation, for instance, of the Italian National, Nationalist Association of the Geographical Societies, which uh, all promoted a more aggressive colonial agenda. Um, colonial themes and rhetoric circulated in an even greater way during the first decades of the 20th century, thanks also to the diffusion of newest mass media like cinema, which did contribute to the popularization of exotic, erotic, and orientalist uh, imaginaries and discourses. A telling example of this comes, for instance, from the following still. Here we can see the pioneer of Italian ethnographic film and scientific films, Roberto Megna, whose leg lies on the body of a leopard, metaphorically dominating the dangerous and wild African landscapes and the African otherness. This still is taken from a footage entitled Leopard Hunting in Abyssinia, which was shot in 1908. And this pretty short movie is part of a film series in which orientalist, adventurous, and exotic narrative conflate. Scenes, for instance, of feral animals, of barely dressed African people singing and dancing, of dusty village and markets convey the idea of a landscape which is backward and untamed out of the time of Western modernity. And although such visual tropes were broadly spread uh, in coeval European productions. This footage is extremely topical insofar as it represents the first film evidence coming from the Italian colonies. It therefore intercepted the diffusion of colonial topics and rhetoric within the Italian society, which would have brought to the Italo-Turkish war. Mm, taking a, 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 a step back, Italy was eager to take advantage of the ailing Ottoman Empire and invaded Libya in September 1911. Colonial propaganda suggested that Libya, as a former Roman colony, should be taken back to provide a solution to the internal problems of Italy, and in particular to divert Italy's overabundant population in the colonies. So the colonial war to gain a Mediterranean colony suddenly turned into a national war. Thousands of Italian soldiers fought in Libya and for the first time in human history, the airplane was used as a military weapon. And I'm gonna show you here an image of Giulio Gavotti uh, who, who had the idea of put some bombs, to throw some bombs in the Libyan territory. Um, so the whole nation was involved thanks to a massive propaganda effort. And cinema too, for the first time, played an unprecedented role 
in that it shaped colonial discourses and imaginations within the peninsula. In the film chronicles about the war, orientalist and exotic nuances were interspersed with images in which the brutality of the war stands palpably out, as the case of the footage I'm going to show you now. This short passage uh, is taken from a film shot by the, one of the most famous film, filmmaker, Italian filmmaker at the time, Luca Comerio, who wanted to confirm that Italy had crushed local resistance. But what struck me at most is not so much the, the, the violent, the brutal hanging, but the images of the Italian soldiers who are smiling, who are trying to um, uh, be in connection with the motherland. Um, the apparently successful conclusion of the Libyan campaign in 1912 did not mark the end of hostilities. Resistance to the new imperial power was far beyond Italy's expectations, and the operation to reconquer Libya uh, was characterized by extensive use of violence, and uh, it began in the, uh, uh, in the wake of the First World War and was not concluded until 1932 under the fascist dictatorship. So we are now moving toward the fascist phase of Italian imperial expansion. So the, the, the fascist government came to power in 1922. And although following the main trajectories of previous colonial policies in the Horn of Africa and in Libya, Benito Mussolini aimed to expand the Italian empire. In its second invasion of Ethiopia in 1935-36, Italy was successful. And that war, by the way, was the biggest colonial conflict in Africa. And fascism pompously proclaimed the reappearance of the empire on the fatal hills of Rome, uh, to quote uh, uh, Mussolini's sentence. And uh, during those months, the imperial relation peaked along with the consensus toward the fascist regime. During this imperial phase, we are in the second half of the 30s, Mussolini's regime managed to invade the Italian society through a vast array of imperial narratives and images. Film propaganda played a pivotal role in spreading racist and scornful images, and discourses about the allegedly civilizing ethos of fascists went hand in hand with a complete disrespect towards African cultures and people. Um, those propaganda films uh, feature, the, for instance, the exaggeration of primitive traits obtained uh, by zooming in on naked or unhealthy black bodies for whom any form of dignity is denied. And I'm going to show you a telling example of this. On the left column, you can find some subtitles. Il 
compito non è facile, ma il risultato non può mancare. E la metamorfosi, seppure meno rapida nella realtà di quello che appare sullo schermo, è veramente completa e non solo apparente. Quello che il selvaggio tiratore vi lancia è stato trasformato in un inappuntabile vitragliere dall'appassionata guida dei nostri ufficiali. Ok, we can stop here. So this is a, again a telling example of uh, how fascist propaganda spread uh, racist and uh, scornful discourses about uh, colonial, the colonial subject. And along with such a disrespectful portrayal, the exaltation of the Italian technical and cultural technology served also to show the redemption of the Ethiopian bodies and soil, as we have just seen and to metaphorically dominate any spot of the colonial landscape. And in so doing, fascist Italy portrayed Africa as completely bent to the desires of the Italian colonizers, as an, a scenario in which to show Italy's qualities and industriousness. This positive portrayal of the Italian presence and the Italian impact uh, uh, in, in, uh, in Ethiopia was completely at odds with the reality of the fascist empire, because Italian armies, for instance, struggled a lot to conquest Ethiopia. The local resistance never gave up, and throughout the five years of the, of the fascist rule, the local partisans called Arbenioch fought against the, Italians, the Italian presence vigorously. So, uh, for its part, fascist Italy did not spare the use of the most brutal technologies like chemical weapons, concentration camps, to crush the local resistance. Furthermore, an apartheid uh, regime based on uh, racial segregation was implemented in the colonies in order to avoid any undesirable contact between white and black people. And actually, th this racial setting was sanctioned by a state law and it anticipated the anti-Jewish law issued in fascist Italy in 1938 and 1939. So in other words, the violence and the brutalities proper of this untimely imperial war anticipated those of World War II more than being the last gasp of the imperial era. Okay. So this uh, imperial setting lasted only five years. It was a frail empire. On, uh, on May 1941, Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia returned to Addis Abeba. He was in, ex in exile in, uh, in, uh, in the UK, in Bath, and he was escorted by the English troops. Allied troops had defeated Italy in Ethiopia, Somalia, Eritrea, Libya between February 1941 and December 1942. The end of the Italian Empire of East Africa intersected with the most significant period of turmoil occurring in modern Italy, that is the fall of fascism and the national reconstruction following the Second World War. And despite the genuine anti-fascist ethos that inspired the Governi d'Unità Nazionale, the National Unity Cabinet, and notwithstanding the feeble international role of post-fascist Italy, the, the post-war governments requested that the colonies acquired before fascist invasion of Ethiopia, so Eritrea, Libya, and Somalia, be returned to Italy. Between 1945 and 1947, Italy's diplomatic efforts aimed at regaining a form of direct control over Libya, Eritrea, and Somalia. But the results fell far below expectation. In 1947, Italy officially relinquished the claims over its former colonies, and only Somalia was eventually turned into a UN trust the territory under the Italian administration until 1960. So Italy's decolonization was thus prompted by international decision by the United Nations, and not so much by anti-colonial struggles by former colonial subjects. These de facto avoided Italian politics and culture to come to terms with colonial crimes and usurpation. The missing critique of the most violent and racist results of the previous colonial history characterized Italy's uh, post-war, post-colonial scenario. And this is the reason why I use the term fail while referring to Italy's decolonial process. 
These political processes and mnemonic mechanisms became visually visible and audible on several occasions. And in my doctoral thesis in Warwick, and also in some articles that have been recently published, I have chosen to focus on non-fiction film, on news reels and documentaries for two equally important factors. On the one hand, they were highly privileged tools to envision the new social and cultural configuration of post-war Italy. On the other hand, I argue the importance of closely investigating these films for their implicit assertion to offer a representation of the post-colonial world as truthfully as possible. So basically constructing a reality which was instrumental to uh, former colonizers' aims. The indexical relationships uh, this footage aimed to establish with what, what happened in front of the camera made them instrumental in delivering political messages, whether directly or in more surreptitious ways. And as I said before, between the 40s and the 60s, a thorough critique of the colonial past de facto lacked in Italy. On the other hand, African people and landscapes were portrayed as still in need of being civilized by Western people. This is especially evident in some documentaries shot in the now former colonies. On the one hand, a series of films backed by Italian post-fascist governments were keen to spread images of Italy's positive impact on the former colonies, whereas not uh, carefully avoiding any public repentance for colonial crimes. Such representation assumed that the former colonial subject did not suffer any traumatic experience during the Italian rule. Any possible disturbing consequence of that experience was meant to vanish in the images of the benevolent impact Italians had had in, on Africans, and also in the representation of Italy's engagement in the future development of the former colonies. And this is clear, for instance, by looking at uh, some film produced in 1946-47 during the diplomatic efforts Italy was, uh, was doing in, uh, in, at the Paris Peace Conference. I'm going to show you an example of this. There are no subtitles, subtitles here, but I'm going to describe the, the, the footage afterwards. So these scenes, but also the, the very first um, section of, of, of this news reel, uh, exalt the civilizing work Italians did in Libya by portraying, for instance, the desert landscape and its transformation in arable soil. The voiceover then provides a scornful description of Arab people. Uh, they, are, uh, uh, they were called nomad fanuloni, which is uh, nomad and uh, lazy bones, lackers. The footage ends with this mordant sentence. We dedicate this film to those who stand as master of colonization, although they have destroyed entire populations with alcohol and rifles. So uh, although not explicitly expressed, the resentment towards France at Great and Great Britain is clear, and it was meant to highlight the different and positive nature of Italy's presence in Africa when compared to other imperial experiences. Propaganda film like this one spread an uncritical image about the impact Italians had in Africa. And this footage was part of a constellation, conglomeration of political and cultural practices that actively fostered a conspiracy of silence about colonial crimes, to use the words by Dietmar Rothelmund, which made the memory of the colonial presence in Africa biased, unproblematic, and vague. Another set of images contributed to strengthening this kind of conspiracy of silence. And I'm referring to several films set in the former colonies that while rearticulating a uh, ethno-anthropological or pseudo-scientific gaze, 
made no reference to the previous colonial relationship. And uh, the, the, the short passage I'm going to show you is took by a film entitled Danze dell'Eritrea, produced and uh, shot in, uh, in Eritrea by Vittorio Carpignano in 1953. Here we have the description of what's happening in front of the camera. Again, empty landscapes and a kind of terra nullius. So in my opinion, the iconographic continuity with the previous colonial production is palpable. The exotic discourse uh, in a post-colonial context uh, functions as a, as a symbolic system, domesticating the post-colonial world for the metropolitan audience. And I'm referring to pivotal works by, for instance, for instance Stephen Foster, Graham Hugan. And as such, the, the, the rearticulation of exoticism, it's a discursive space that creates and controls the culturally different by providing forms of cultural translation that help defining collective identities. And in this case, the collective identity of post-war Italy, which was shattered after World War II. And this form of post-colonial exotic and its commodification was central to the casting of a renewed form of alterity, which simultaneously inhibited a critical reading of previous colonial discourses. Um, in so doing, new exotic and erotic desires and images spread, especially in relation to the ethnographic portrayal of the former colonial space. In this production, Africa is presented once again as a mysterious continent where time is suspended or rather, rather has never existed, and nature dominates everything. So this footage and more broadly post-war political and cultural practices have contributed to repress and disarticulate more than erase the recollection of the colonial past. They resort to an epistemic posture, assuming that the right to look and to understand Africa remains ingrained in the eyes and in the minds of Western people. Africa remains a distant yet familiar space in which to impose new forms of economic, political, racial, epistemic, and cultural hegemon. Furthermore, the continuity in visual discourses I, I have tried to point out is entangled with the difficult coming to terms with the colonial brutalities and discourses whose effects still reverberate nowadays in Italian society. Accordingly, the intricate memory of that period has not simply evaporated, Rather, it seems to have become indecipherable yet present, detached from the main narrative of national history, yet concealed in the ways through which to reimagine in post-war subjectivities and collective identities. Um, I'm moving towards the last section of this talk, which is about the haunting presence of ghosts of the empire in the Italy's contemporary scenario. And, uh, Drawing a kind of perfect circle, I would like to conclude with another personal story. Uh, on November 2015, I was in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia researching on the Italian community living there and on the legacies of the colonial past in the urban and social environment. I plan to visit the, the, the foreign cemetery, inside of which is the Italian cemetery. And as soon as I arrived, I noticed a coming and going of elegantly dressed Italian people they were preparing a mass to celebrate the National Unity and Armed Forces Day, the national day through which Italy commemorates the victory in World War I and more generally the national unity. I suddenly felt a strange feeling concerning the contradictory conflation of meanings related to that event celebrated in that specific space. The Italian community, mostly composed by people somehow related to the colonial past, was commemorating the national unity surrounded by graves of soldiers and workers who died in the attempt to build the imperial, uh, to, to build the, the, the Italian empire in Africa. 
So keeping alive that memory in that city, a city that experienced the violence of the fascist imperial ethos, made me think about the transnational yet complex and violent nature of colonial memory. In that side, I observed the interplay between material and material memories, between living and dead elements. In other words, the liminal condition of the colonial past, which is neither fully present nor fully absent, belonging to a ontological domain, and I'm referring, of course, to Derrida's pivotal work. I, I was surrounded by the ghost of the Italian empire, and I'm referring not so much to the bodies of the thousands of known and unknown soldiers who died during the Eastern Ethiopian War. Rather, the spectral presence of, I'm quoting, the unresolved histories of racial and ethnic oppression, and of quotation by Steve Krebs, haunted the spatial organization of that site. The different types of graves reflect the reason that brought Italians to that part of Africa. On the left, we have uh, the graves of people who arrived in East Africa at the beginning of the 20th century, mostly business persons, workers with different expertise, uh, explorers, missionaries. On the other hand, the thousands of graves of unknown soldiers tell us about the violence of a cruel fascist world and uh, about the violence of a racist empire. The traces of the fascist presence are still visible in, uh, in, in the central area of Addis Ababa, and they intersect with the post-colonial spaces related to the Italian community, which have been, of course, re-signified by post-colonial interaction, interactions and meanings, but which still bear the marks of a violent and unburied past. Especially the, the cemetery and the celebration I attended to, like other places in the city, is and still remains a site filled with contradictory meanings in which the natural transition from colonial to post-colonial setting is suspended. It's a heterotopia in which the boundaries separating the past and the present are uncertain, a site where the ghosts of the empire are questioning the very roots of our histories and cultures. And the ambiguous dimension of Italy's colonial memories, which are simultaneously material and immaterial, as I said at the beginning of this talk, is even clearer if you look at, at another heterotopic site, that is the former colonial museum in Rome. Uh, last year, the Museum of Civilization in Rome, of course, announced the reopening of the former colonial museum, now named Italo-African Museum. And um, on the one hand, the name, this name reminds a rather generic historical connection between a state, Italy, and a continent, Africa. So replicating a kind of colonial way to understand the relationship between Western countries and the outer world. Um, how, and this name does not explicit, explicitly mention the colonial phase and the distinctive Eurocentric idea which informed the history of the collection housed in that space. The museum was established in 1923, and it soon became one of the most important uh, propaganda tools uh, in fascist Italy. Um, the, the reopening aims, of course, to give a new status to the colonial objects by exposing the violence hidden behind them. However, the inherently problematic nature of such material heritage might be exacerbated by the partially unacknowledged result of colonial legacies and of the colonial past still, uh, still haunting Italian society. It's a matter of fact that the greatest part of Italian society has no clear idea about national colonialism. However, Today, we have seen that the, the past has influenced the making of modern Italy in surreptitious yet significant ways. That experience has left, likewise left enduring traces on those countries where Italy acted as a colonial power. And the memories of that relationship are, for instance, embodied in the thousands of people who are escaping wars and reaching the southern coast of Italy, mostly departing from Libya, our former colony. And it's no coincidence that a relevant part of migrants and refugees are escaping from former Italian colonies, namely Eritrea and Somalia. This is just to say that the colonial past and it, 
its long lasting effects are pivotal experiences to understand not only Italian history, but also the current processes of migration and multiculturalism. In other words, are uh, pivotal experiences to understand uh, Italian contemporary society and politics. The, um, the geographical position of Italy and the growing number of migrants, refugees coming from the northern shores of Africa are urging us to consider Italy as a privileged standpoint from which to observe how the legacies of Western empires are shaping the contemporary world. Those legacies can be spotted, for instance, in our multicultural societies, in the monuments of our cities, in the food we eat, in the films we watch, in the music we listen to. However, and more worryingly, those legacies are also embodied uh, in the people who seek a better future escaping their country than once upon a time where, where, once upon a time where our dominions. The dead bodies lying in the Mediterranean Sea are the ghosts of Western imperialism. Their lives and their deaths challenge our national histories, our political system, and our consciousness as human beings. So colonial and racial discourses have also shaped an allegedly monolithic idea of national belonging. And this idea is, for, uh, luckily enough, increasingly questioned and undermined by a growing number of persons and groups like activists, researchers, artists, practitioners, writers, musicians, who are all attempting to deconstruct the colonial legacies still present in a legal system of citizenship based on the use sanguinis, the rule of blood. And in so doing, an increasing number of decolonial practices is aiming to expand the borders of Italian citizenship and belonging. And just to conclude, what I've tried to do today in this talk is to intercept the genealogy of unproblematized memories and legacies, their sedimentation in the national subconscious by showing that the colonial past still influences the ways in which we see the world and the configuration of our society. Such a research, of course, has a strong critical and ethical component. However, this does not imply that we must exchange methodological meticulousness for ethical and social engagement. Rather, the more critical and historiographical tools are sharpened, the less colonial debris might find the legitimation in our societies, especially considering the intolerant and extremist discourse that are dangerously resurging nowadays. The ghost of empires could, in other words, rest in peace only if you are able to expose their haunting presence in the ways in which we recollect the past to understand the present and to, to build the future. I stop here. Thank you very much, Gianmarco. Um, we'll have some questions now, so you can either type your question in the chat or raise a hand or um, just speak if no one else is speaking. Um, yeah, so over to questions. I have one if um, everyone's a little shy to begin with. I was really interested in what you said about um, the idea that the countries um, from which contemporary migrants come um, were um, former Italian colonies. Um, and you said, you know, it's no accident. I find that intriguing because the narrative, you know, I've come across more often is that um, it's like Italy just happens to find itself on the southern kind of coast of Europe and so on. So I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about that. Mm. Yeah. Of course, there are. Thank you for this. This is a very sharp and spot on question. And the point is that. Uh, uh, Italy, for instance, in the Red Sea, basically created some uh, states, some entities. For instance, Eritrea was not a state before Italy invasion. It was just a province of the Abyssinian Empire at the time. So drawing some borders, for instance, is a way in which a colonial power could manage the situation on the field. But we know that the border uh, between Eritrea and Ethiopia is a hot one because there, there has been several wars in the 90s, in the early 2000s. So this is a, just an example to say that uh, colonialism crinkled and corroded the, the societies and the ways in which also the former subject have built their, their own states. And this is a very, you know, approach which is very, um, 
eager to, 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 to be in contact with the colonial school of Walter Mignolo, uh, um, Enrique Dussel. So the way in which we, uh, as European, we created colonial states is not just a matter of political action. Of course, it's, it's political, uh, it's a political discourse, but also it's an epistemic uh, way to understand uh, lots of um, issues that are going on also in the countries which uh, suffered the Italian presence. And in Libya, it's uh, clear as well, because uh, uh, actually Gaddafi only in the 1970s um, invited Italians to leave the country. So a proper decolonization happened only 50 years ago. And uh, the, the Italian community, even after the end of the formal presence after the World War II, between the 40s and the 70s played a crucial role in the economic system of Libya. So we could not understand what happens, uh, what, uh, what's happening right now if we are not aware of the long lasting relationship in terms of colonial discourse and colonial practices. Mm -hmm. And of course, on the other hand, we have all the consideration about the representation, the ways in which migrant people are perceived, are, uh, you know, represented in the uh, Italian slash European or Western way to, to approach the issue. But I think that we also we need to consider at the same time, this political, epistemic, and also cultural ways to approach the issue. Mm -hmm. Hope to have answer to your question. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, is it something that's starting to come through or that is mentioned a bit in kind of just Italian, um, you know, kind of normal press that people would read generally this kind of colonial connection or is it more, is it something that's more discussed in more specialized kind of decolonial circles? Or? Well, actually it's, it, it's still an issue um, which is, uh, you know, enclosed in some circles which are, you know, very keen to, to work uh, or with, uh, with the colonial legacies. Um, but there are two different, let's say, two different approaches. One is related to the um, multiculturalism, which is a hot topic in, in it's a buzz term also in political discourse. And uh, um, on the other hand, there are the material legacies of that experience. It's, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's our, duty as researchers, as practitioners, activists, to connect this kind of uh, material presence, material legacies to the general discourse about the composition of our societies. Thank you. Um, I see Elena has said her microphone's not working. If you want to put a question on, in the chat, um, feel free, and equally anyone else can feel free to put a question in the chat or raise your hand. Um, in the meantime, um, I just return to what you said at the end about kind of social engagement and critical and methodological tools and the relationship between the two. Um, what do you think, I mean, which methodological tools have you find most valuable in, um, in conducting this project of intersecting national memories and like a decolonial memory? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm trained as an historian. So, um... The, 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 the critical historical approach brought me also to, 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 to use some post-colonial and in particular decolonial uh, theories and critical practices in order to enlarge my, my horizon in terms of what kind of epistemologies are reproduced also in the anti-colonial thinking, for instance. But I think that more practically, what is important to do is to build connection between academia, between arts, between uh, social engagement, and uh, just try to, to create a transnational and transdisciplinary environment in which to, to address the multifaceted ways in which colonial legacies are still, uh, um, are still uh, working in, in, uh, in Italy. But of course, I think that it's, uh, it, it's a kind of, uh, of discourse that might be applied also to other contexts. Oh, thank you. It's really helpful. I see Elena has a question in the chat now. Well, yeah, I was just wondering. Can you really... see that? I can read it. Um, it said, it says, um, thank you, Elena, for this question. It says, you've 
first I'd like to thank you for your, your speech. And um, the question is, you described an iconographic continuity, um, but have you ever found some elements of discontinuity in the context of the collective memory? Well, of course there are discontinuities. But it, it really depends on the period in which uh, uh, the, 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 the films were produced. For instance, in 46, 47, we are very close we, at, the, at the end of the empire. So the real footage used to, to craft uh, the newsreels, for instance, the post-war newsreels was actually the same shot by the fascist propaganda. There was a kind of re-semanticization through the voiceover and the voiceover starts uh, to mention, for instance, the cooperation, uh, development, words like this. However, there is also a discrepancy between uh, the images and the, 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 the words. Um, another discontinuity is that it is, is more clear, maybe in mid 50s, uh, when the colonial issue in terms of political action of the post-war government, so Italian post-war governments wanted to stay in, uh, in the former colonies, at least in the colonies conquered before fascism. So the political issue uh, uh, about the former colonies uh, soon became marginal because there were other problems in Italy, like reconstruction, Marshall Plan, Cold War polarization, the democratization of the system. So the colonial uh, and uh, the, the loss of the colonies be became a, a bit marginal in this discourse. However, in the mid 50s, there is the, the return to a form of ethnographic point of view. So there was a description of uh, the African otherness. In terms also uh, very close to the, for instance, for the cinema verite. So the voiceover was not so, so overwhelming in, in the films. So we, we can see a, a, at least a try, uh, at least an attempt to, 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 to provide a more unbiased, uh, a more unbiased portrayal of the former colonies. But at the time, there were not the former colonies. This was simply Africa. And that's the reason why it's important to understand why exoticism actually helped in uh, forgetting the colonial past. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered to, to the question. Thank you, Elena, for, for your... I, I, it, it's, it's a very brilliant point. In, in my thesis and also in some articles, I've tried to point it out also the discontinuities. But another just another uh, quick point is that also the ways in which the public films were produced were very close to fascist propaganda because post-fascist government actually reused the institutional setting of production inherited by fascism. There was a private company, uh, for instance, the Settimana Income, the income, who actually was controlled by the government. And there was also the mandatory screenings of films in post-war Italy, like, like it was in, in, post, in, in fascist Italy. So the similarities are also structural, not only in terms of iconographic uh, discourses. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, Gianmarco. Thank you very much for this, this presentation. I really enjoyed. I enjoyed it. I, en I enjoyed your bold use of images because it's a very sensitive issue. But I do appreciate that. I know. I think we have to broach these very difficult. If if those images which you were showing were shown across cinemas in Italy, then we should be prepared to look at them and engage with them in the way in which they were deemed to be consumed. Uh, in the 1930s, so I think that's really important. Um, I've got a question likewise about the cinemas, because uh, I've not been working on this area for I don't know, 15 years or so, so, uh, so I'm a bit out of, out of the loop with the literatures. But I was, I was very impressed by the, again, by the moving images you show as well. Have you got any sense of how many, of what the distribution was across Italy through cinemas? How many people on average might have seen these images so you can see so there was this production of, of a visual economy but how far did it reach into italian society that's always been the big question you say well they're there but do they impact to what extent do they impact who do, what parts of society are impacted by these and i just wonder if your if your phd is, is you've managed to get any further with those questions well thank you david it's it's a very important question as well because um there are, of course, some different um, 
ways in which those films reached Italian audience. For instance, the, the films about Libya, that, that the people who actually watched that was incredibly uh, less than uh, the people who watched the fascist newsreels because fascist news, newsreels were mandatory. So, and we know, for instance, looking at the, the works by Stephen Gandalf, David Forgax, that between the 30s and the 50s, there was the golden age of cinema. It was the, the most uh, important pastime for Italians. So I can assume that, for instance, between the mid 50s and the 40s, the 80% of Italian people could, uh, could have watched these, these films also because uh, we, we are going to deal with not simply with the stable movie theaters, but also with the theater and shows which, are, which were brought in Italy and in the colonies as well. I've, I've done a research about the, the diffusion of uh, film shows in the, in the Italian empire. So it, 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 they were, this footage was very well spread. And about the reception, it's a, it's a big question mark. And the same can be said for the post-war uh, period because cinema still remained uh, the, the biggest uh, past time um, until television spread. So we are talking about the late 50s. Um, I was saying, uh, uh, well, about the, the, level, the level of appreciation, which is, I think, the, the, the biggest uh, question marks. And uh, um, I just want to, to, to observe that uh, in some records I found, for instance, at the Archivio Centrale dello Stato, the Central Archive in Italy, of the archive of the Instituto Luce, which was the fascist state propaganda institution, there were there was lots of criticism toward the way in which propaganda, col colonial propaganda was engaging Italians. There was a, uh, you know, a endless, as, as I would say, endless concern about the fact that those films were not totally in tune with the fascist discourse about the, the empire. But of course we know that the fascist discourse about the empire was extremely multifaceted, complex, was composed by different suggestion, futurism, nationalism, uh, more traditional ways to understand colonization, but also, uh, uh, on the other hand, a religious ethos. So it, it's really hard. Uh, as far as the post-war period is concerned, there, there, there has been the, the project Italian Cinema Audience, uh, which, have, which has actually shed an important light on the mechanism reception, but there is no specific work on the reception of the colonial topic. As I just can just quote, for instance, Nicola Labanca, who said that Italian people were more, were more interested in, uh, in the northern borders issue in the post-war aftermath. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just one, is that in your plans? Are you hoping to do that work then upon the nature of the audience and its reach and impact? Well, uh, in, in the monograph I'm just writing, which is only about the fascist uh, film uh, propaganda uh, system, there is a, a section on, uh, on how fascist film were, were uh, you know, spread and, and, and how they were, if they were, whether appreciated or not. And I, of course, I'm planning also to, to write another, another book on the decolonization but in that case, uh, there, there are just some records about the discussion uh, among people involved in the production of that films, okay? Not in the audience reception of that. And just to conclude about the newsreels, the newsreels, uh, the services of the newsreels we, are, we have watched today are part of biggest uh, broadcast. Our newsreels are composed by eight, 10 services coming from different parts of the world. So it was a kind of uh, montage of images. Among those images, there were the, the, the colonial, uh, the colonial issue. And it made me think also that uh, this kind of discourse uh, could, be, could have been you know, uh, entered in the Italian society also in more surreptitious ways in, in, because they were in a montage of different different uh, kind of images and services coming from all over the world about colonial Italian politics, sport, uh, 
glamour, so on and so forth. Thank you. I see Nicolo has has a hand up, and then and then Davide. Yeah. Thank you so much for the presentation. First of all, it was really enlightening and enriching. And I have a question regarding your research process. And I'm curious because I know that studies in post-colonial studies in Italy are, are sort of a recent thing. And since every colonization process is very specific and very depends a lot on the context, I was wondering if you ever encountered any challenges in uh, theorizing like decolonization processes in Italy, maybe you felt that you didn't have the right tools comparing to other decolonization processes and, and how you overcame these challenges in, in your research process. So, thank you. It's, it's a tough question, actually. Um, it, it, it's, it's brilliant, actually. Um, I, I organized a symposium in 2017 to address this kind of question, how peripheral colonial experience uh, might draw something uh, by uh, theories and decolonial, postcolonial practices that uh, are born in other contexts and in bigger, bigger imperial contexts like British of France. I think that uh, we need to uh, recover a kind of historiographical, a critical uh, point of view in order to elaborate some uh, postcolonial, decolonial theories and practices which may fittingly apply to the Italian case. Because, for instance, the nature of Italian imperialism, of course, in the late 19th century was very similar to other experiences like Germany, but during the fascist period was it started to be very different. So we need also to, to, to use different uh, also theoretical tools to approach the fact that uh, uh, the fascists wanted to, to, to create an empire when the other empires were starting to, to, to collapse. Um, actually, in my first PhD here in Cagliari, I've done a, 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 basically a, an historical reconstruction of the mechanisms of propaganda. In my second PhD at Warwick, I, of course, uh, I, I dig into more specifically on theories. What it's, I think it's important is to understand the formation of memories. Just the, the only advice I can, I, can, I can share with you is that the, 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 the transnational formation of colonial memories, which is uh, an, um, the only way we have to connect that history with more contemporary uh, practices. I know maybe my question is it, it's a bit fuzzy, but uh, I think that it's really hard to address a peripheral colonial experience. But of course, if we look at Italy, but also Germany, for a certain, um, for a certain extent, also to Portugal, the Netherlands, there are lots of countries which share this kind of peripherality in the geography of post-colonial theory. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Davide? Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Dr. Mancuso. Uh, it was a really interesting uh, presentation to listen to. I, I come from a field, the European studies, which has still a lot of uh, untalked about uh, issues with uh, colonization and decolonization. And uh, I think the focus on the first post-war period is very interesting because you even see in the Schumann Declaration the uh, task of development of Africa as one of the main tasks of United uh, Europe, which is not very talked about uh, in the past uh, decades, let's say. Um, but actually, my question would be more on a, on a curiosity on, a, on another issue uh, that you showed somehow in the videos, uh, which is architecture and the role of architecture in uh, building memory and in entangling then decolonization in the sense that uh, um, you showed how uh, Italian built architecture in, in Somalia and in, in Ethiopia still uh, brings these memories about. I also wonder what other role it may have. And um, this question is also because I was recently looking at uh, relations between Yugoslavia and Ethiopia in the, in the 50s, and the column in uh, Yekati 12 was actually built by two uh, Yugoslav uh, sculptures, artists, 
in the same way in which they were building anti-fascist monument, which remind, remembered the victims of uh, Italian occupation of Yugoslavia during the Second World War. So there is also a north-south uh, circulation of architectural practices, which, uh, which gets into this uh, building of memory. So I wanted to, to hear if you have any thoughts on, on, on the role of architecture in this uh, process of uh, memory building. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a fantastic question. And uh, about the connection between Ethiopia and, uh, and, uh, and Yugoslavia, there, there has been a fantastic um, exhibition in London in 2018 called uh, uh, Red Africa about uh, the, 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 the ways in which the Cold War shaped this transnational alliance of leftist communist uh, parties, uh, especially European or Soviet architects went to Africa to celebrate decolonization through monuments. On the other hand, uh, talking about the Italian colonialism, if we look, for instance, at Asmara, the Eritrean capital city, is an example of modernist architecture. But uh, I think that we, we, we need to talk about uh, architecture within the fascist context and not fascist architecture. Um, of course, the, the things changed when fascists decided to, to set the, the empire, to organize the life in the empire according to racial uh, principles. And uh, if we look at the works by Mia Faller, for instance, it's clear that uh, uh, Italy wanted to uh, organize urbanistically the, the cities according to very, uh, very tough uh, and very rigid uh, areas, boundaries which were separated according to the skin color, uh, basically. And uh, what is interesting, but it's a, it's a, it's a personal, on a personal point. Uh, when, I, when I was in Addis Ababa, I noticed the re-semanticization of these places. And I think that is the most important thing. And it's also a thing that we need to think about, about uh, uh, in, in relation to the monuments celebrating the um, colonialism, fascism in Italy too. But it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a transnational debate. And uh, I think that the post, a truly post-colonial ethos in approaching the architecture might be achieved only if we try to give a, a new meaning to that material, uh, material uh, traces. Hope to have uh, get get a point and answer to your your question. Any thanks? By all means. Yeah. Um, well, unless there are any other questions, I'd just like to thank Gianmarco again for that very enlightening talk and also a fantastically rich and insightful response to the questions. And to thank all of you for coming because I know it's a busy time of year and I'm sure there are lots of other calls in your time. So thank you, Gianmarco, and thank you, everyone. And thank you, Sarah. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.